Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to Calvary Online. So glad you've joined us today. We're going to be turning our attention to the book of Daniel, the second chapter, the 21st verse. If you want to find your way there, we'll be looking at the verse, actually coming back and forth from it into some deeper verses throughout the message. In eight weeks, my tenure here at Calvary Church as lead pastor will come to an end. There is a bright new day dawning for Calvary and a bright day for Sherry and me also. The eight weeks that remain are bookended by Sundays, so I've got nine Sundays and I want to preach a series of messages, nine things I must say before I go. It's my sincere prayer that in the latter half of this series, we'll be able to gather together again. It's a distinctive peculiarity in all nine of these messages that I'll be preaching from texts that just have five words. You see, there's no communication so succinct, so efficient, or so effectual than the scripture. Today, I want us to turn to Daniel 2 and 21. Five words. He changes times and seasons. He changes times and seasons. Now, this passage is lifted from Daniel's first encounter with the great ruler of his age, Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel wasn't speaking of Nebuchadnezzar. He was speaking about God. And so, because God is unchanging, Daniel really speaks to us across time. He changes times and seasons. Nebuchadnezzar was, in terms of biblical geography and earthly riches and power, the greatest king in all of the world at his time. Daniel describes him this way in Daniel 2 and 37. You, O king, are king of kings. King of kings. But great power and responsibility often rob men and women of sleep, and Nebuchadnezzar couldn't find rest not because of the state of affairs. It was because of the dreams he dreamt that he couldn't really rest well. His dreams escaped the night and they lived on during the day and he just couldn't get away from troublesome dreams. We all have occasional dreams that stick around long enough to subject them to some type of analysis, but they're pretty occasional or, or rare I find that most of my dreams disappear almost immediately. You know, we sleep a third of our lives and we dream for a good part of that. But like a hard drive, reality just overwrites our dreamscapes within seconds of our awakening. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar's delete key stopped working and his dreams just wouldn't fade. And it made the most powerful man in all of the world Afraid. He knew something important was at play. He also knew that the self important minions who surrounded him would only tell him what he wanted to hear. And so he called them all in and demanded they give him a full explanation of what was happening in his dream life. And let me paraphrase it for you. He says, Tell me what I dreamed, tell me what it means. If you don't, I'm going to cut you to pieces and burn down all your houses. If you can tell me the dream and what it means, you'll receive gifts and rewards and honors. Oh, and by by the way, boys, the clock is ticking. The clock is running even now. And the wise men and counselors, they couldn't do it. They couldn't even begin. They didn't know what the king had dreamed. How could they interpret what they didn't know? And so they told the king and the promised extermination of these wise men and counselors, it began. As the blood began to flow in Babylon, Daniel became aware of the terror, and he waited before the Lord, and God gave him answers. Then, before that fateful appointment was made, where Daniel would go into the presence of the greatest king on the earth, Daniel offers up this majestic, glorious, poignant praise to God. Reading from Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, 
to whom belong wisdom and might, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give praise and thanks for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. So Daniel begins by praising the Lord, elevating God, even before he steps into the presence of the one that he calls king of kings. Daniel steps into this extraordinary crisis. He steps into this crisis with a leader who's teetering on the edge of madness and bloodshed is waiting in the wings. You see, Nebuchadnezzar made a common mistake among the rich and the powerful. Not exclusively, even among the poor and disenfranchised, we tend to believe that life revolves around us. That ultimate power is the product of money or the ballot box. That reality is what is seen, not what is not seen. Through the ages, history records a steady stream of contenders and pretenders grasping at power, fighting for control, seizing control to discover that they control nothing at all. I grew up in St. John, New Brunswick in the 1960s and a shout out to my Canadian friends. I have one of those frozen childhood memories, and it's truly frozen because that day it was cold outside, snow on the ground. I was just a little boy. And for those of you in Canada who are watching today, it, it was the Lancaster Shopping Mall in West St. John. Outside most stores in those days, you could find these little coin-operated kitty rides. And the memory that sticks in my mind is of my dad plugging a dime in to this little red sports car. He put me in the driver's seat and I grasped the wheel. The car made revving noises and it kind of rocked back and forth, but you could turn the wheel. I sawed away on that wheel like a madman until the ride was all done. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't turn anything. I affected absolutely nothing, but man, I looked good. The ride was over in no time and all I had really done was played to my fantasies and spun a wheel around on a squeaky bolt. And that's what all of the power of the world is like when you compare it to the power of God. Presidents, kings, and prime ministers who walk the halls of power and play with the great treasuries, spinning wheels connected to nothing, and thinking that somehow they're winning the race. Nebuchadnezzar was under the impression that he was the apex, the apex of the human species. Listen to his boast in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30. Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Look at Nebuchadnezzar, the man who thinks he's in control and in truth, not even for a moment. When Daniel appears before him and unpacks the meaning of the king's troublesome dream, he begins this interpretation by saying, in effect, you are the king of kings only because God has given you the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory. Daniel 2, 37. You're king only because God has given this power to you. And I want to go back to Daniel's praise to God in Daniel 2 and 21 once again. He changes times and season, he removes kings, and he sets them up. In our troubled times, in a modern world, in affluence, where every man is a king and every woman a queen, where we boast that we are the captains of our own souls, our own destiny, has God delegated his ancient powers has he yielded to us the times and the seasons? Do we make our own kings? Has his throne been threatened by post-modernity? Have we filed him now under fable or myth? Has he been somehow weakened by the devil? 
Or has the devil made a comeback? Is the cross nothing but a dusty relic? Perhaps salvation is found by strong arms, swinging political ball and mace. The spirit of Nebuchadnezzar is alive and well. Spiritual ignorance and foolish arrogance have created for us a virulent culture that dethrones God to enthrone pretenders. Today they all bunker down with sycophants and advisors pointing fingers, assigning blame as a virus threatens to destroy the great house of cards they have claimed as their new Jerusalem, their shining city on a hill. Lost in the din of protest over tarnished rights and the shrieking of a very tired political machinery and the rage over our loss of self-sovereignty, there is a voice that cannot be silenced, a voice that spoke to times of calamity coming on the earth, a voice that speaks a promise for the ages. Listen to that voice. When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain or command the locust to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 7. I'm grieved that I won't be taken seriously today when I appeal to you for an an absolute moratorium for a period of one week, a moratorium on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, Breitbart, NPR, and the rest of the babbling horde. One week, one week where nothing is offered on the altar of partisans. One week where nothing is offered to the gods of public opinion. One week where nothing is offered to the almighty dollar. For one week, let us humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and repent. For he has promised he will hear, he will forgive, and he'll heal us. But can we tear ourselves away from the tiny glass screens that are demanding all of our attention and stirring all of our fears. You see, today we have a very big problem and a very small God, and that says it all. We have a very big problem and a very small God. We need a big God, and when we have found him again, for I fear we've lost him, When we have found him again, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Grace, his unmerited favor to us. Do you need me to describe this strong God to you? Well, I'll describe him in Daniel's words in the second chapter again. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have no understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Light dwells with him. He changes times and seasons. Sometimes God changes those times and seasons in a gentle fashion, and we do enjoy the passage. That's when we just write poetry and we take a lot of pictures. But today, he's changing our season with a big storm. But nonetheless, a new season, a new season is coming. How often have you heard the experts say it over the last few days? Things will never be the same again. We're going to have to find a new normal. We can't go back to what we once knew. A new season is coming. And though this season has changed us in the midst of a storm, is this season absent God's power or presence? December 9, 
1914, fire broke out in Building 41 at Thomas Edison's sprawling campus of laboratories and storerooms in New Jersey. Edison's son, Charles, writes of the event about his father in a book entitled The Electric Thomas Edison. A huge portion of the Edison plant was on fire. And Charles writes, when I couldn't find father, I became concerned. Was he safe? With all his assets going up in smoke, would his spirit be broken? He was 67 years old, no age to begin anew. Then I saw him out in the plant yard, running towards me. Where's mom, he shouted. Go and get her. Tell her to bring her friends. They'll never see a fire like this again. Edison's son continues. At 5.30 the next morning when the fire was barely under control, he called his employees together and he announced, we are rebuilding. One man was told to go and lease all the machine shops in the area, another to obtain a big wrecking crane from the Erie Railroad Company. Then, almost as an afterthought, he added, oh, oh, by the way, anybody know where we can get some money? Later on, he explained, you can always make capital out of disaster. We've just cleared out a bunch of old rubbish. We'll build bigger and we'll build, we'll build better on these ruins. And with that, he rolled up his coat for a pillow, curled up on a table, and immediately fell asleep. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't sleep. I want to say to you today, friends, we're going to get through the virus crisis. And we're going to get through this transition period at Calvary Church. And we are going to see our finest day. And if that sounds like I'm imitating Thomas Edison, then I might add, oh, and by the way, anybody know where we can get a little hope? A little hope? Aren't we called to hope? Don't we share an eternal hope? Shouldn't we among all people be the most optimistic about tomorrow? Shouldn't we be those who are looking forward for that's where our joy is. That's where our completion is. That's where our salvation is. Shouldn't we be a people who are absolutely on fire with a sense of God's unfolding destiny in us? He changes times and seasons. And I know this so very well. Have you that same trust? Have you that same confidence? Is there a better time? Is there a more appropriate moment to completely surrender your life and times to the unchanging God to bow down before the lordship of his son, Jesus. Changing times, pestilence, calamity, trouble, fear, storms, darkness. <laughs> In the midst of it all, is there a better time to surrender completely? Father, I pray for one who would listen today and sense your presence very near, sense deep within them something calling out. I pray for that one who even now recognizes that they're living at a loss, unable to really grasp that eternal hope that holds those who trust in you, even in the midst of trouble and calamity. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that in these moments you would speak to their hearts. I thank you that you have promised, O Lord, if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I thank you, O Lord, that your arms are wide open to receive us even, even when we have been to the pits of despair, even when morally we have been compromised. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that in grace and mercy you reach out to us. And I pray, Lord, for your extended hand today, met by that one 
who will reach in time of trouble and find you to be their sure and so certain hope. And to these things and in these things, we give thanks and praise and glory to the God who changes the times and the seasons. Continue to walk steadfast before the Lord, hold hope in your hearts, and even if it seems you're losing, know that in a short time, you're going to look over your shoulder and see how God has delivered you. Let's be steadfast this week. May God richly bless your life as you walk with him. What a great word from Pastor David. We've enjoyed worshiping with you today, and we hope to see you again this week through our social media platforms or church app and online right here at the same time next week. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way and you want to partner with us financially to impact the world for the kingdom, you can click on the give button on your screen or go to calvarytriad.com forward slash give. Thanks for watching. God bless. And we'll see you next week.